pleased today to have as our speaker Warren Perrin. Uh, Warren has created or, or dedicated all, if not most, of his adult life to understanding and uh, chronicling the history and the language of the Acadian people. And uh, we're fortunate to, to have him with us today. Uh, before I get into his uh, professional accomplishments, uh, Warren and I go back to college days. Uh, we were both at the uh, University of Southwest Louisiana, or ULL as it's called now. Uh, we were fraternity brothers back then. Uh, at one time, Warren was the president and I was the vice president of fraternity. And uh, it did stay on campus during that period. We had no issues. <laughs> so that was an accomplishment some of them to face with. Uh, while in school, one day, Warren comes into the attorney house and says, hey, anybody want to go bail hay? Well, I was from New Orleans. I said, what the heck? I'll go bail hay. So, uh, so we did. We went to a little town called Erath, uh, outside of Lafayette, where Warren's family had a farm. And we did indeed bail hay. Uh, which was very interesting, not a career path, but very interesting. <laughs> so, um, uh, while we were there, uh, Warren's mom fixed uh, dinner for us. And at the house, uh, Warren's parents were there, of course, and his grandparents. And as us college kids sat around, I could hear this, somebody talking French in the background. And that's how it was at the time in Lafayette. Um, there was a generation that opted out of the English language, or did not end to the English language as a preferred language so much as they did the French. Um, of the commercials on TV in Lafayette, they would do the automobile commercials, and they'd do them in English, and they'd do them in French. Now, they didn't have words for, like, automatic transmission. So you'd hear things like talking about a horseless carriage or however they would phrase it, and then it would be automatic transition. <laughs> Um, so it was pretty exciting times, fun times to be in Lafayette, uh, getting to know the people of Lafayette, getting to know them. Um, Warren, after he left USL, uh, got a doctorate in uh, law from LSU. Uh, he's an attorney with his firm in Lafayette, Perrin Landry and Devon A. Uh, he was a skilled professor at Loyola Law School. He's president of the Code of Phil, and that's the Council for the Development of French in Louisiana. Even back at that time, when we were in school, um, or that shortly afterwards, that became a popular thing. Uh, cause was to try to preserve the language and the culture of Southwest Louisiana. Anyway, he's he's done numerous things, numerous awards, uh, French National Order of Merit. Uh, the University of Saint Anne in Canada gave him an honorary doctor's degree. Uh, he's authored nine books. Author and co authored nine books on Louisiana French history, including Acadia now, uh, then and now, which we'll visit on today. Um, his, his resume goes on. He's been an ambassador, uh, Francophile, Francophone, rather, summits in Romania, New Brunswick, Canada, Vietnam, Switzerland, uh, guest lecturer at Yale University, goes on and on. If I keep going, he won't have time to talk. So, the, um, he, another thing of interest, he convinced the uh, English government that they needed to apologize to the Acadian for the deportation from Acadiana and was actually successful in that. He'll address that when he talks to you. So, anyway, um, he's accompanied by his wife Mary, who is also an accomplished author and student of the Acadian history as well. So. Uh, Warren, if you step up. And you might mention more of his capabilities. A college highlight. In our Kappa Alpha days, uh, we have a Kappa Alpha Rose every year. And besides her outstanding career, Mary was also the K.A. Rose back in the day. So, should we sing now? We can sing later. We need Peter to sing. <laughs> And Mary is uh, is an artist. She's featured in the uh, 
Ogden Museum. She's uh, some art in the permanent collection in New Orleans Ogden's Museum. She's also in the uh, National Museum for Women Artists in Washington, D.C. And she has a Master of Fine Arts. And although my name appears on most of these books, she's really the editor. She edits uh, the books. So what I'll do today, thank you for those kind words, Chris. You brought back great memories. Um, we, we did this book in conjunction with one of the World Acadian Reunions, which occur every five years. It's called the Congrès Mondial Acadien, which is World Acadian Reunion. The first was in 1994. And every year it brings three to 500,000 Acadians to various parts of the world. Louisiana hosted it in 1999, when Lieutenant Governor Kathleen Babbitt of Blanco was Lieutenant Governor. It was a great success. So in anticipation for the one which occurred in uh, 2014, Mary and I started two years before putting this book together <clears throat> called Acadia Then and Now. This is the French version. I have brought some English versions if anybody's interested after for sale. But it's sort of a mini encyclopedia of the world. It, it highlights at least 55 places where you can go today and find an Acadian presence either through a museum or a festival. And that would include places such as, surprisingly, Maryland, Michigan, Texas. There's probably more Acadians in Texas than in Louisiana in the Golden Triangle. One of my trick questions when I lecture on Beausoleil Broussard, I say, where do you find more Broussards? And everybody says, well, Lafayette, Abbeville. The real answer is Houston, Texas. That's the most number of Broussards. So we're all over the world. It's estimated maybe five million Acadians or descendants of the original are in some, probably most countries of the world. So uh, this particular book we did it with uh, the help of Phil Como from Montreal. He helped us do the French version, and it was awarded the outstanding Prix France Acadie in Paris, France, as the most outstanding history book published that year in the world on Acadian history. And we were the first Americans to win that award, and uh, we were very honored to do that. We actually sell a lot more French books than English books, and we have them on sale in most of the federal museums in the country. It's very popular with the tourists. And um, so what we'll do is we'll get started. This PowerPoint features a lot of the maps and pictures that you will find in this book. Uh, I'm assuming most of y'all have a general knowledge of uh, Acadian history, based probably on the reading of the poem Evangeline, perhaps. Uh, but do you know why we're called Cajuns in Louisiana and Acadians anywhere else? Anybody know? Good. I'm going to, at the end, give a couple of test questions and we're going to give an award. So pay attention to these, these dates. When the Acadians arrived in New Orleans, they, could, they called themselves Nous sommes des Acadiens. And they expected to be received by the French and they were received by the Spanish because uh, Louisiana had been ceded secretly to Spain after the French and Indian War. And so the Spanish couldn't pronounce Acadien, so they tried and it came out Cadien, and ultimately it became anglicized as a contraction Cajen, Cajun. So it's just a corruption of what every other Acadian calls themselves in the world, Acadien. So the, uh, the map will show you the areas from which the original Acadians deported and departed in 1604. And I'd like for you to think about your pilgrim's history as you're listening to me tell you about Acadian history, because there's some interesting parallels and starking contrasts. At the same time, in 1604, they were recruited to go settle, not as religious zealots as the pilgrims were, good, hard-working farmers. At the same time, England kicked the pilgrims out because they had become radical Puritans and they were afraid it would destroy the Anglican faith. So they were kicked out and they went to Holland. 
where they remain for about 16 years. Next slide. And the first settles, settled in, on the map, it shows Nova Scotia. It's, it's like a number seven attached by the Chinictu Peninsula, right there. And it was originally called Acadia or Acadie. And for the next 150 years, they developed a unique culture. They developed a wholly new way of viewing life in Acadie. Ultimately, it was changed to Nova Scotia in 1713, when through a peace treaty, it was ceded, but other areas remained French in 1713. But, next, I wanted to point out, if you would ask me one word that distinguishes the Acadians, it's the word aboiteau. Aboiteau is a word for a method of reclaiming marshland from the sea using dikes and flat valves. So the first thing the Acadians did, they made friends with the Native American people. In Canada they called First Nation. And the, the tribe that occupied this whole area, which we're not talking about Acadie today, at the beginning we're talking about the state of Maine, the provinces of Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick. It's a huge territory. And by making friends with the Mi'kmaq Indians, they picked up their ways, the good ways. They picked up birth control methods using plants, so they had their babies in the summer, not the winter. They knew how to not disturb the hunting grounds that the Mi'kmaq had used, so that bounded their friendship by going out into the marshlands that you see in the Minas Basin. They reclaimed this marsh. Once you got rid of the salt after three years of rain washing, you had 50 feet of topsoil, so you didn't need a lot of land. You didn't disturb the natives. They started converting the Mi'kmaq to Catholicism. They weren't, they weren't zealots, but they were all Catholic. And they even got one of the chiefs Mermen to, to convert to Catholicism, and many of the men marry Mi'kmaq women. Mary and I descend from Mosulay Broussard, the first to come to Louisiana, and his great grandmother was a Mi'kmaq, and our DNA, my DNA confirms that. About 18% Native American. Next. So again, you see, this was the first big fort. It's a national park today. And you can see the, the outlying marshlands. Now, you recall, you saw that Nova Scotia was like a big number seven. So all the tides are trapped as they come up the coast. And the highest tides in the world are right at the end of that point, the Chinictu Peninsula. There's a national park there where they have 84 foot tides every 12 hours. It's phenomenal. So, to build a dike while the tide is out requires a lot of manpower. So it made every man, woman, and child within walking or riding distance work on one farm one day. They had to actually build a levee, and then they used a special system they developed of taking the marsh grass and packing the levee so that when the water hit, it didn't hit dirt, which would crumble, it hit grass, sod. So the most important men were those who had this trick of cutting sods and, make, and joining it together. And they used oxen to walk the levees all day long. They attached paddles to the ox feet, and that's how it would pack the soil. But that work ethic together bonded families forever. And that's why we call fifth cousins close family. <laughs> so you start to see what's happening to these Acadians. They're picking up more Native American and they're losing their European ideas. And they're picking up ideas of representative government. And the idea that maybe government shouldn't be telling us what to do. Independent thinking, which was unheard of at the time, for peasants, but this was all coming from the Mi'kmaq people. 
So let's go back to the pilgrims. In 1620, when the pilgrims were, were uh, kicked out of Holland, they bought a passage on the Mayflower, led by Edward Winslow, the leader, who wrote the compact on the pilgrims' ship before they left. And they basically went to continue this off-the-rails puritanical view of religion and life. And in 1620, when they dropped anchor at Plymouth, the Acadians were electing delegates to represent them. They were experimenting with representative government. And fast forward to, uh, you can go to the next slide. This would, what a typical Acadian would have looked like at the time. Next. And here is the friendship that developed. And Mary and I hosted a woman, Norma Muse, who is a tribal elder. There are seven plantations, not plant, reservations of the Mi'kmaq. They teach Mi'kmaq immersion on their school grounds, just like we do French immersion in Louisiana, trying to keep the language alive. But uh, we hosted Norma Muse, who did a fire ceremony at our museum in Iraq, and she symbolically gave us a piece of corn and said, when your ancestors arrived, my people showed you how to grow corn. And I'm giving it this as a symbol of our friendship. So that goes back 400 years, this relationship still exists today. When we have Acadian reunions, the Mi'kmaq people attend, and they're part of that ceremony. Next. So let's go to 1680, down the path, leading to 1713, when it becomes Nova Scotia. At that time, the Acadians were stopped calling themselves French. They called themselves French neutrals. And then 50 years later, they stopped calling themselves French neutrals, and they picked up their own nomenclature, Nous sommes des Acadiens. They believed they were no longer French or North American. They were a new way of doing life, a new people. And what was happening to the pilgrims in 1680? Think back, Salem witch trials, burning the teenage daughters at the state to get rid of Satanism in their community. So if you were trying to create two different kinds of people, you couldn't do a better job than create the pilgrims and the Acadians. And they were next door to each other. And they were controlling the future of North America. Now, there were some French that had settled Quebec in 1608. That was a growing city. But the population explosion wasn't occurring there. It was occurring in Acadie. It was, they were doubling their population every 20 years. That's the highest population growth ever recorded in North American history. The average family had 12 children. Healthy. Healthy mothers made healthy children. When the pilgrims were having their babies survived at all, the mothers were not healthy. So they were, the big fear became overpopulation, overrun by these papist Catholics from the north. Sort of like Game of Thrones. You keep hearing and you see they were writing these articles. They are threatening us from the north. Winter is coming. These Acadian papists are going to take our children away from us. Boy, they can see the population doubling every 20 years. So, next slide. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, leave it right here. That's, every story has a Darth Vader, an evil, evil doer. You're looking at evil personified. Nobody liked this guy, Charles Lawrence. And he accidentally became governor when the acting governor got an eye infection and had to go back to London for surgery. And he took over the government in Acadie in 1713. It became Nova Scotia. So he is in charge of the British government that is now occupying what had been the French colony of Acadia. When that treaty was signed, the Treaty of Utrecht, the Queen of England was Anne. She is referred to as Good Queen Anne, because she was. 
And she realized, if I'm going to keep these hard-working, thrifty Acadians in my colony, I'm going to have to let them practice Catholicism. And she granted an exception, because if she had not done that, they would have all departed and gone to Quebec. But by doing that, it's the only time in British history they allow people to practice the Catholic faith. That's how much she respected the Acadians and wanted them to remain to support her soldiers. Because sort of what was happening is everybody is realizing the British or the French will control North America. And the big war was on the horizon, the French and Indian War. And so she gave them one year to stay or go. So those, a lot of them left. Our ancestor, Beausoleil Broussard, didn't trust and hated the British. He packed his horses and carriage and he took off and left and went live inland with the Mi'kmaq. But about 5,000 remained. By remaining one year, they became British subjects, having all the rights as a British subject. And so here comes the war on the horizon. And he concocts a scheme with the leaders of Boston. We're going back to the Pilgrims people. The deportation, the ethnic cleansing that led to the deaths of one third of the Acadian people was hatched and carried out by the grandchildren and great grandchildren of the Pilgrims. It's not like Longfellow wrote in, if you, if you ever read Longfellow's classic poem, Evangeline, he puts all the blame on the redcoats from London. It's fiction. Evangeline is a totally fictional story based on a historically accurate background. But Edward Winslow's great-grandson, John Winslow, put an ad in the paper in Boston. And it's like Goebbels of the Nazi propaganda wrote the article. It's like ethnic cleansing personified. I need volunteers. We shall march to the north and rid forever the papists who threaten us from the north. We must get rid of them forever. And we must make their children realize they have to become good British subjects. 800 men volunteered from all over New England. And they secretly marched and took over every little colony quietly, pretending they were there to protect them. And then it was announced by him on September 5th at 3 p.m., every man shall appear at every church for an important announcement. It wasn't unusual that they would hear something like that. And it almost brings me to tears every time I say this, but they considered a 10-year-old boy a man. And we have a 10-year-old grandson, so many 10-year-old boys never saw their mothers after that day. Because once they were seated, the doors were locked, they were told they were in prison, and they, he read, he had it read in every church, that all your lands are confiscated, and you will leave and be deported, and you can only bring what you can carry. The, the wives had to feed the men and boys so they could bring in the ships. They didn't bring the ships in. They were, they were hidden. So finally when the men were captured, they brought in the ships. It took 30 to 60 days to load the people. It was total chaos. So we'll see some of those scenes next. Uh, to make sure they wouldn't... Uh, you can go to the next one. Uh, this is where they're setting them up, pretending to be friends, but really not. So go to the next one. So here... The men are arrested. Many men are killed. Some try to resist. Most can't resist. They had they had to leave their weapons home. Uh, they, they had confiscated their ships, and they started burning the barns. And it was right at September. They had just harvested all of their wheat. So all the barns were packed, so they would go up in flames. It didn't take much. And uh, the wives were still in the houses, so they didn't burn the houses yet till a little later. But they ultimately burned everything they could to the ground. So uh, next... And you see here the people on the, on the beaches waiting for the ships to come. Uh, families, in some cases, were treated fairly okay, but most of the time in the chaos, families were separated. A, a lot of them never reconnected. That's what evangelism is about. 
Evangeline is about. She was going to marry Gabriel the next day. She was the prettiest in the village. She was the smartest and the strongest and the handsomest. And they never found each other again, although she spent her whole life trying to find him. And even came to St. Martinville, Louisiana, in the Bayou Test, where she had just missed him because he was going to uh, uh, capture cattle in Texas. And so she ends up going to Sisters of the Mercy, caring for the poor. And one day she hears her name whispered, Evangeline. And she looks and she sees Gabriel, he's dying in a poorhouse. And she, she cradles him, they kiss, and he dies. So that's Evangeline. And it captivated the world. It was a number one best-selling book for 14 years. And he, if, if Longfellow, who is in Boston, if he doesn't write Evangeline, I'm not here today talking, and you would have never heard of a Cajun. Because both sides, the, the French and the English, didn't write, speak, or sing about the deportation for a hundred years. And we historians call it our century of silence. Because the British descendants realized that what they had done was contrary to British law. It was terrible. It was genocide. And the Acadians were scattered all over the world. What are you next? Uh, they say that the Acadians had over 200,000 head of livestock. They were cattle, they had sheep, pigs, goats, horses, mules, oxen. You can imagine those animals being left behind. And they said you could hear the screams of the dogs and animals. It was just the worst chaos in that. It was, it was hell. Next. Created by Europeans against Europeans. It's never happened again. And if you Google ethnic cleansing North America, this pops up number one. Number two is what we did to the Native Americans in the Trail of Tears. More Native Americans died, but about 5,000 Acadians perished. Four ships went down, wiping out entire families. So most of them died of disease. As soon as they left their native Canada, they hadn't been exposed to any other tropical diseases. They were an isolated people. They had never had an epidemic because they wouldn't, they weren't sailors, they weren't travelers, they just were workers on their farms. And so as soon as they left and went to the ports in Boston, Philadelphia, and New York, as far down as Savannah, Georgia, they picked up whatever they was there and they died. Uh, the, the ones that suffered the most, next, the ones that suffered the most are those that were shipped to Virginia. Now, Lawrence hadn't consulted with the governors of the British colonies that he was going to send them to the British colonies. The ships just showed up, and then they got off. The captain said, I have 202 Acadians. You shall feed, clothe, and shelter them by the order of the governor. I mean, of, of the of Lawrence. So the local governors mostly followed orders and called all their the pilgrims' descendants Put them in barns, put them in sheds, put them with your cattle. You got to feed and shelter. And they, these were the enemies. So you can imagine how the, the colonists felt. In my back barn, I've got a Catholic, Acadian. I've been preached all my life how they're no good and dangerous. And I got to feed them. Yes, you do. Well, the governor of Virginia wouldn't let them get off the boat. Kept them there for 45 days. And these were not ocean liners. <laughs> These were transports for cattle, so you can imagine the conditions. The boat had to set sail for London. Why? Acadians were British subjects. They could only be sent to a British colony or a nation. Couldn't send them to France, so they had to send them to England. So those people had to cross the Atlantic and they were put in warehouses in Falmouth and Plymouth, Massachusetts for the duration of the war, seven years. And then ultimately they let them go to France after the war. And many of those came to Louisiana, but it took them 30 years to get permission to come join the first group. It's a hell of a story. You can't make this stuff up. I mean, Longfellow did a great... The poem about Longfellow, the reason his poem is so important, it's the first great literature by an American author. And he paints Evangeline as the heroine 
when before women were relegated to subplots. But Evangeline comes across as a strong American icon. So we all long felt a debt of gratitude for keeping that story alive. So this is called a diaspora. The word is scattering to the winds. And I won't even go into the details other than first they went to the British colonies. 5,000. 5,000 died and 5,000 escaped. Those who escaped led by our ancestor and your ancestor, Bosolet Brusson, joined ranks with the Quebec French and fought and lost at the Battle of Quebec. And North America was lost. The French Empire fell to the British. So our ancestor, Bosolet, was starving in the woods in northern New Brunswick in the middle of winter, and he negotiated a surrender. After Quebec fell, it was over. And they marched them to George's Island in Halifax Harbor. And today, it's not allowed, no one is allowed to go on the island because they estimate there's 500 Acadians buried in unmarked graves while they were held in that prison for four years. Uh, Beausoleil's wife, Agnes, died on the island. Two of his daughters died and one son. He had 12 children. But his granddaughter, Elizabeth, was born in the prison camp. And ultimately, he was allowed, Beausoleil negotiated for a ship to leave and come to Louisiana. He could go anywhere but home. Does that sound familiar? We, we Americans are doing that today to Al-Qaeda at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. We have people in prison, non-enemy combatants convicted of nothing. That's what these Acadians were in that prison, just like Al-Qaeda, just fighting for a cause and just getting captured. So what are, what are Americans doing? We're allowing these Al-Qaeda prisoners to go anywhere but home. They sign an agreement and then they leave. That's what they did to Beausoleil and his group. So he, the first ship went to Saint-Domingue, which is now Haiti. They stayed there about a month. They regrouped. They picked up some Acadians who had been stranded there, and they dropped anchor in Port of New Orleans on February 18, 1765. So it took them about five months to get from Halifax to New Orleans. They were, nobody knew who they were or why they were there. But, um, next, um, we do know it's reported they got off the boat, they knelt in prayer, and they danced. And then they went to the little church where St. Louis Cathedral is, and my son Andy did a sketch of this. He found a sketch of the church from Algiers Point looking toward the quarter. It was a little bitty wooden church, and they baptized Elizabeth Brusson first month. So that's why we know the date. We don't know who was on the ship. It was a private charter. We don't know where he got the money. We suspect the Nova Scotian government gave him the money to get out of Dodge. Because he had killed a lot of British people in the war. And he had used the tactics he learned from the Micmac. And he had scalped soldiers and he had shot him in the back. And that's not the way you were supposed to fight in 1760. He was supposed to stand in a field and shoot each other. But by using his terror tactics, it made him a terrorist. And that's why he had to leave. And we know that they stayed in Algiers in a warehouse for four months. They were so weak, it took them four months to recuperate where they gained enough strength to be able to row a boat across the Chafalai Swamp to get to the prairies of South Louisiana where he owned ultimately win. I know a lot of you have a, a lot of history in New Orleans. I will point out that of the first group, 202, the only way we know who was on the boat, they, uh, they had card money exchanges. They didn't have paper, so they would use playing cards to write when they would cash in whatever little money they had when they left, like a check, an IOU. They were told when they would get to New Orleans, it would be redeemed. And so there were 30 heads of family called chiefs. Again, they're thinking like Micmac. 
There were two women, heads of family, and 28 men. So only by that card number do we know the original. And we found that document in the archives of France, the Maritime Archives. And we have the original in a copy at our museum in Iraq. That's the only record we know of the first family's names. Now, they started showing up in marriages and births and deaths. But, I mean, there's no record of the first. The biggest group to follow came from Maryland. About 600 came. And um, they couldn't settle where the first group had settled, in the prairies, so they had to settle more in the wetlands, Lafourche, Terrebonne, Homa, Thibodeau area. So you kind of got the marshland Acadians and you got the prairie Acadians. But Beausoleil got the better of the deal because he negotiated a cattle compact and he negotiated all the lands they could settle on the Bayou Teche, we call it today Acadiana. You can go next. This is the map today, which we call Acadiana. It's a 22 parish area. Stretches from Texas to the Mississippi, going up to Avalos Parish in central Louisiana. We have our own flag. And on our flag, I'll show it to you in a second, we pay homage with the gold castle of Spain, because it's Spain that really hosted the Acadians and treated them so well. They gave them not only all the lands they could sell, all they had to do was bring cattle to New Orleans. Because the source of cattle had been the Florida parishes. Felicianas, Mississippi, Alabama was British. But after the Treaty of Paris ending the war, those lands were British, and so they couldn't get cattle from there. That was the enemy. So they had to go west. And the Acadians struck out west because they weren't afraid of the attackable Indians who were man-eaters. The attacker ball would capture three men. They would eat one and let the other two go. So everybody said, don't go to Lake Charles. <laughs> They're going to eat you there. And they would do that. So all of South Louisiana was called no man's land. And, uh, but Beausoleil was part Micmac, so he wasn't afraid of a Native American. And so within one generation, they were up on their feet prosperous because the Spanish gave them tools, weapons, everything they needed. Boats to go over there, picked out the best lands. Um, so it was called Atacapa because of the Atacapa Indians and later designated Acadiana. Uh, we are about half a million Acadians in Louisiana, estimated. About the same number in Quebec, about the same number, a little less in France. A lot of them went back to France. But um, we are, according to the last two census, the most culturally diverse region in the United States is right here. We've got German festivals, Thai festival, Vietnam festivals, you name it, we got it. Spanish, Mexican, Hispanic, we got everything you can find right here in KDI. It's always been a welcoming region. It's where Zarico and Creole music came from. Because those slaves escaping plantations on the Mississippi or being granted their freedom, they couldn't go east. That was British. Not good. They headed west. It was unexplored, unsettled around Opelousa, central Louisiana going into Eunice. And so these, these slaves captured wild cattle and started their own ranches. And today, you go to these areas, all of these black men speak French, wear cowboy boots, have their cowboy hats, and they sing in French. So uh, there's a lot happening in this area here. And it, it's, I like to say, we didn't choose to come here, and the blacks didn't choose to go there. Kind of forced. So it, it kind of makes you want to keep what heritage you brought there. It's not like they came here to become anglicized <laughs> Americans, right? We still, in our language, call non-Cajuns Americans, like we're different. Now you might say, Warren, that's a pretty bold statement. Why do you, we, I'm a lawyer, we have a case decided in federal court in 1980, Roach v. Dresser Industries, where a Cajun from Crowley, an engineer, they kept calling him the pejorative Kunas. Don't call me a Kunas, I can sue you under the Civil Rights Act. Because the judge ruled, we are a protected minority under the Civil Rights Act, 
as are Asian, Jews, African Americans, Hungarians. You are only protected if you are a citizen that has an ethnicity other than American. So the judge made that determination. Although Acadia was never a sovereign nation, it was only a colony. The judge ticked off what are the characteristics of nationhood. And we had it all. We had everything. We had the language, the culture, the history. So he says, I rule Acadians are protected under the Civil Rights Act because we created a new ethnicity in North America. Next. So here they are going up the Bayou Teche to settle. Next. Uh, it took them two years to build a house. Uh, they got hit with smallpox, La Picoche. 30% of them died the first year. We don't know where Beausoleil and the leaders are buried. We created a nonprofit through our museum, and we've donated $400,000 to the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, and we fund an archaeology effort for the last five years to locate the burial site of the first Acadians. We believe we know where it is. It hasn't been publicly announced, but if you don't want to tell anybody, it's on the Bayou Teche right near the little town of Lauraville, just north of New Iberia. Yeah, you know, area. And it's, they probably buried their first group next to an Indian burial mound, which was on the hill. That's where you would expect you to bury. And Beausoleil's youngest son, Amon, died a rich, rich man in St. Martinville. There's a record. He owned slaves. And when I tell that to, to Canadians and French, they cannot believe that we were treated like slaves. And as soon as they got to Louisiana and they got on their feet, they bought slaves because they had to adapt to compete in that environment. Most Acadians were not like that. Most of them had small farms, but they were all fairly successful very quickly because we were the first cowboys. And Mary and I went lecture at the University of Texas at Austin. I gave them the same lecture I'm giving y'all. I spent more time gigging them saying we were the first cowboys a hundred years before you guys were going up with Hopalong Castle and the trail going to uh, Kansas City. And it's true, there's documents that they were bringing the cattle to New Orleans and that's how they got wealthy quickly on cattle. And my family still has 3,000 acres of land in the Million Parish. We still have cattle. We still have rice, crawfish. It's in our family lands. We've never sold one acre. It's part of our heritage. Next. Uh, this is one Acadian village in Lafayette. There's another place called Vermilionville. It's a reenacted you know, sort of um, what would you call it? Rural life, folklore. Yeah. People are there like uh, making demonstrations all the time. Mary is in charge of a, a, a healing garden where they've identified 60 plants, native plants that were used by our ancestors to treat disease. Next. I'm going to go kind of quick. A typical inside a village uh, house. Next. Next. I'm going to go quickly. He was the first governor, Acadian Mouton, Governor Alexander Mouton. During the Civil War, he was governor. Next. Uh, that's to remind me to talk about the cattle. Yeah. Now, I'm, I want to tell something about Amon Brissot, Mosulay's youngest son. There's a book that was written 10 years ago by a woman named Elizabeth Duval. And she featured, she's from the University of South Carolina, PhD history. She featured seven people that nobody ever heard about that helped to win the American Revolution. There's a chapter devoted to Amman Brissot. Because when Spain declared war on England for the American Revolution, the Acadians volunteered and joined the Spanish militia and defeated the British at the Battle of Baton Rouge, Mobile, and primarily the most important Pensacola. When those, when the, the last fort fell, Armand Broussard was the lieutenant of Governor Galvez, and he was credited with the siege. They siege. When those forts fell, Mississippi and the Gulf was lost to Britain. Two months later, the British surrendered at Yorktown, and Washington complimented the Spanish for helping win the war in the South. Washington didn't have to worry about that. The Spanish took care of that with the aid of the Acadians. Next. 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 
This shows an Acadian tied to a tree. They didn't have a dog in that fight in the Civil War. Many of them were conscripted and had to serve. That's why he's chained to the tree. First time he would have a chance, he'd walk home. Next. 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 You don't want to hear about the Civil War. Next. Next. Okay, this, this begins the degradation of our culture, making fun of it, making us kunasses. Not just kunasses, but dumb kunasses, because we couldn't talk English. My daddy was called a dumb kunas, drafted in the army, he couldn't speak until they realized he could be used as an interpreter. And Lee Bernard from Erath was a tank command at Normandy. He said, they call me a dumb kunas in Texas. I get to Normandy Beach. I can be an interpreter. They call me Sergeant Bernard. <laughs> so, but this appears in the most popular magazine in America, Harper's Weekly. It's a series of articles. They came down and they couldn't understand who these Acadians were. They couldn't talk English. They didn't want to talk English. They didn't, they didn't care about uh, money. They just wanted family, fun, and freedom to practice their religion, basically. But this picture, you would never have represented a woman this way. Leg spread, bus line. The man looks like he's a uh, running a prostitute or something. I mean, he's lecherously looking at the women. So it just starts this whole idea that we're some kind of low class people. And we, we still fight that sometimes in some ways. They, they criticize Coach Edge Orgeron, the LSU football coach, because couldn't, couldn't talk English. You couldn't understand. Well, that's the way it is. That's the way they talk in Bayou Lafourche. Okay, next. 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 These are all 1930s. And the reason I'm doing that is because one of our books, must buy book, I only have four of them. It's this book. In 1930, the first trip was organized where the Acadians went back to Nova Scotia and Grand Pre for the first time. Led by a man from my hometown, Senator Dudley LeBlanc. Anybody ever heard of how to call? Who's that done? You've got to buy this book. Because this woman, Corinne Broussard, who's a cousin, this lady, from Bullbridge, she was voted the leader of the 25 Evangeline girls to go on this trip. 1930, depression, prohibition. And each girl had to raise $250 for a 17-day train trip. And Corrine was working for the Manships, who had the advocate newspaper in Baton Rouge. And they sponsored her, and she gave them newspaper articles to publish, and they're all in here. When Corrine died at 104, her son gave, her, gave us her diary and all her souvenirs. And so we put this book and annotated it. So it's like a little girl from Broadbridge never went out of town, and she's going, she's hosted by Herbert Hoover, the White House. I mean, they're fed, when the train crosses into Canada, no prohibition in drinking in Canada. <laughs> they started drinking, and they had they got drunk for lunch and dinner. Every day. They didn't want to come home. So that's why I'm showing you what 1930 would be. So next. Large families continue. This is at the Crowley Rice Festival. The family that showed up with the most kids won $50 prize. <laughs> next. Uh, we can talk about brown cotton the rest of the day. It's a fascinating subject. There's only a Native American tribe in Arizona and the Acadian women that would use brown cotton to make brown blankets and using the indigo for the blues. And you'd say, well, why would you want to make a brown cotton blanket? Brown cotton is hard to grow. White cotton is easy to grow. But if you made a white blanket and you went in the dig or the bayou and washed it, turn brown. So you start out with a brown one. Makes sense. So these blankets today are worth three to five thousand dollars. And uh, we, we do exhibitions in our museum in Ira. We have um, eight spinning wheels. We just inherited one that came from Canada and we just got one from a couple in Metairie. They bought it and it we have it documented it's about 250 years old. And because of the wood, the chestnut wood, it had to be made in France. So it was probably brought over by the Acadians. So we have a we have a terrific exhibit on textiles. 
You ought to organize a, a bus trip to come to our museum. We'll cook you a jambalaya. Yes. By the way, I gave the cook my recipe for jambalaya. So maybe next time you're going to have I use four meats. Go ahead. Next. Again, 1930. We did it to ourselves. In 1916, we passed a state law. Couldn't speak French. School grounds, public schools, or public buildings. No French. So the language was kept alive by music. And so for 55 years, we were shamed again, this shaming, until Coderfield was created by the state agency under John McKithen. But the man who made him do it was Cousin Dud. Because Cousin Dud elected McKithen governor by campaigning for him in French for the Cajuns. And the payback was, we're going to save the language. Now, I don't know if we're going to save the language. I still speak it. My grandkids speak it. It's a patois. We use old French. We use Spanish words. Lanyap is not a French word, folks. Lanyap is Spanish. Okay? And we use a lot of the Native American terms for animals and plants. Because we didn't know what to call them. So the Indians told us what to call them. So the music has always been important. But we started these festivals, Coderfield did, Festivals like I did, Festival International, these big cultural that really brings the tourists to our state. Next. I'm, not, I'm probably talking too long, huh? Keep going, brother. None of y'all work anymore, though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is uh, funny that you're in Abbeville, Louisiana, and they have a sign how to get to New Orleans. Nobody ever said New Orleans in French. No Cajun has ever said New Orleans in French. You know why? They called it the Ville, en ville. There was only one city at this time. The rest of them were towns. So no, no Cajun said Nouvelle Orléans. Next. A lot of service. We just did a program at the World, Two, World War II Museum in New Orleans on Frenchy. We have a podcast where we've interviewed 100 Cajun soldiers who were used as interpreters during World War II. It's a fabulous program. Um, that if you're interested, Frenchy podcasts, you can catch all, a lot of the interviews there. Next. 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 There's the flag adopted. There's the castle. And uh, the fleur de lis, we didn't get that from the New Orleans Saints. They got it from us. That's the sign for the Bourbon kings of France that allowed the Acadians to leave. And Pope Pius declared patron saint Mary. So we have the gold star representing Mary. We have, we have um, a, nat a world holiday coming up August 15th is World Acadian Day. Feast of the Assumption because of Mary. So there's a tie there to uh, the religion. Now, this man in the glasses was the first president of Coderfield and I was the third president. I served for 16 years under five governors, which is why I got to represent Louisiana and all of these foreign countries. Next. And a lot of these come from this book, which we use in French Immersion. This is for uh, middle school students to learn Acadian history in French and English. I'm going to conclude by saying two things. One, uh, this is a miniature version of the Queen's Apology. I sued her in 1990 because America apologized to the Japanese Americans for their internment. 210,000 Japanese. Each living Japanese was given a written apology by Ronald Reagan and a $20,000 check saying, we're sorry, you lost all your lands and you were in prison. I knew that story because a friend of mine, Walter Amahara, was four years old when he was put on a train with his eight brothers and sisters, a pregnant mother, and sent to a swamp camp in Arkansas. I didn't know they had swamp in Arkansas, but he tells me they do. They didn't have a room big enough, so they had to put him in a barn until his mother had the baby, then they built a room big enough for the, the family. So it struck a chord with me that what happened to Walter happened also to my ancestors. And so I, I prepared a petition. I delivered it to 10 Downing Street and uh, the castle where Queen, I, you had to sue the government and the crown as two different entities. Queen represents the crown, Prime Minister represents the government. And I didn't sue for any money, I sued for an apology. I gave them 30 days. The 28th day they contacted me through an embassy representative and said, 
We have hired lawyers in Houston. They'll be in touch. Don't, don't go further. Five years of negotiations led to me getting a meeting with the Prime Minister of Canada, Jean Chrétien, and he gave me 15 minutes to sell him on the idea, and I did, and he got behind it, and the Queen signed it on December 9, 2003. The original document is in the archives of Canada. We at our museum have the only signed copy. This is a copy of it. It's in English and French, and it's used in our French immersion schools. It's, it's a concise statement of history. It's the first, it's the sixth apology in the thousand year history of the British crown. Sixth one. And she, she went to Maori Indian in New Zealand and apologized in 1995. So that gave me encouragement. I had been at it for five years, so I knew I had a chance. And I was interviewed in February my reporter who was charged with doing the biography of Queen Elizabeth II on the occasion of her 70th anniversary on the throne. And I asked the reporter, why do you want to interview me? And she said, you're the only person that ever sued the Queen. What do you think about it? <laughs> I said, well, I think they wanted me to say something kind of nasty, controversial. And I said, the Queen is the wisest woman who ever lived. <laughs> I just gave her an opportunity to do the right thing, and she right. did. So it's a good story, and it's, it's allowed me to be invited to a lot of wonderful places to share this story. I was one of the first Americans that I know of to go back to Vietnam for a Hanoi at a, a World Francophone Summit in 96. I didn't go as an American. They wouldn't allow Americans. I went as a Frenchman at the, at the invitation of President of Chirac, of France, and uh, he came sit with me, it was a 12-hour trip, and he sat with me for about an hour, and in perfect English said, I want to hear you talk some Cajun French, <laughs> you know, and I'm just supposed to refer to a, a, a person like that as vu, not tu, tu is familiar, I tu tu him all day long, because we don't vu anybody, <laughs> he loved it, but he said, let me tell you about my Louisiana story, he said, I was uh, one year I studied Tulane in economics. I got my master's degree. I wrote my dissertation on the port of New Orleans. My landlord was Dr. Dupuy, a Cajun from Opelousas. I had an apartment at 1001 Burgundy. And Dr. Dupuy got me a job making extra money driving a taxi cab in New Orleans, Louisiana. <laughs> President of France. So, he said, the first time my picture appeared in a newspaper was in New Orleans, and I lost it. Can you get me a copy? So I came back, went to see the editor. We got it. We sent it to him. He looked like a movie star, this picture of him. And um, he autographed it and sent it back with a thank you note. We have it framed at the Codafil office. So that's my story about the Queen's apology. Mary and I were invited to do a talk at the Jean Lafitte National Park in the French Quarter on Bastille Day. July 14th, French holiday. The Bastille started because they stormed this prison. The man in charge of the Bastille was a Mr. Delaunay. He was the only person killed. His descendant, Delaunay, fled to New Orleans during the French Revolution. And his descendant is my law partner, Gerald Delaunay. That's why they settled in St. Martinville, Louisiana, as many French fled during the French Revolution. But we have to show you, the family loaned us a diary book that was kept by Delaunay's wife, who was a Spanish princess. Now, it's very difficult to read. It's very fragile. If anybody wants to come see it after, I'll be happy to show it. I'm going to conclude by saying this. There were only 3,000 Acadians who came to Louisiana over a 50-year period. They kept drifting in from different places because this is the place they all wanted to be. They didn't want to be in France. They didn't want to be in South America or French Guiana or Haiti or Martinique. They wanted to come to Louisiana. The biggest group came in 1785. That's 30 years after the deportation. 
There were half a million French people that came to Louisiana. Compare half a million to only 3,000 Acadians. But the half a million who came, came to become Americans. The Acadians did not come here to become Americans. They came here to maintain their culture. That's the takeaway of, of my talk. Is that's why we still have so many places in the world that still proud. You go to some places in France, they fly the Acadian flag on top of the French flag. And i got pictures to prove it to you. Okay. There's a world Acadian flag, and then we're the only one that has some other people. We're the only ones that have our own flag in the world. So you have two kinds. This is the world Acadian flag. You can see it again. Oh, it's easy. I'm here for questions. I'm here for book signing. I'm here for whatever you want. Yeah. Question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And they went to Nova Scotia, did you say in 1604? Yes, sir. So that predates, obviously, the Pilgrims and Jamestown. Yes, sir. Wow. The Acadians had the first continuous settlement in North America, although it was in Canada. It's an American settlement. Yes. Sure. Uh, they start calling it now genocide. You, you don't want to compete with the Jews. The Jews had four deportations in their history. We only had one. But the same percentage of people died. They say if there had never been a deportation, the population of North America would be in Nova Scotia and not New York City. If that population growth had been allowed to continue unabated. And they were very prosperous people for the times. Now, you all know the term kanai? Is it kanai? Kaniving? Oh, kanai. Kanai, it's French. They were kanai now. And the women were kanai too. They were very progressive. We made a talk yesterday. We do a regular talk at the Jean Lafitte uh, in the French Quarter. And uh, we spoke on women in history. And I didn't touch on that much, but that's a whole subject. I mean, if you're going to double your population every 20 years, you've got to credit the women, right? So they were obviously fertile, passionate, progressive. They were leaders. In, in, in one case, uh, a man was accused of fathering an illegitimate child. The prosecuting in the court was the mother. The witnesses were women. The defense for the defendant was a woman, his mother. So they were involved in everything. And they... You go back to their songs, they, they drank beer with the men at night, they sang the civitous songs. So they were way out there. They, they, were, they were picking that up from the Mi'kmaq, because that's the way the Mi'kmaq treated their women. Um, when uh, I was invited, this is a personal story of our family. Time to quit. <laughs> when I made a talk in France, we met a young Quebec lawyer, Jean Vallette. He came to our house, met our daughter, they got married. Aww. And now we have grandchildren that are half Quebec and half Cajun. So a lot of things happened because of that. Thank you all very much. <laughs> <laughs>